Well, good afternoon. We're moving in the right direction and we need to keep going. And we can't stop now. We must stay strong. Our hospitals have capacity. Our team is stockpiling PPE. And our testing strategy has allowed us to stay ahead of this virus. Because the sooner we can detect COVID-19, the sooner we can stop the spread and protect others from the infection. A few weeks ago, on April the 10th, I stood at this podium and promised you that we were going to ramp up our testing. We set a target of 16,000 tests per day by May the 6th. And thanks to our incredible team, thanks to the hardworking folks in our health system, we beat that target. And just over 20 days later, by May the 1st, we hit 17,000 tests a day. The good news is we're leading the country in daily testing volumes, both in total tests and per capita. Over 342,000 tests have been completed in Ontario to date. These gains are significant, but we still have a lot of work to do. We will not rest on our laurels. That's why we remain laser focused on ensuring we're testing our most vulnerable. We rapidly increase testing in our long-term care homes. We're testing those in group homes, homeless shelters, women's shelters, and other congregate settings. And as the key trends head in the right direction and the health system continue to be strengthened, it gives us confidence. It gives us the confidence that we can adapt. It gives us the confidence that we can reopen more places safely, knowing our health professionals have our backs. It gives us the confidence that we're getting close to opening parks, that we're getting close to opening retail for curbside pickup. It gives us the confidence that we are on the right track, that collectively, as a province, we're doing the right things and we're taking the right steps, that we're beating this terrible, terrible virus. And it tells us that we can't stop now. We need to continue looking out for each other. We need to keep taking the health advice seriously. We need to stay vigilant and if we do, if we stay the course, we will defeat this virus. We can and we will. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. I'll pass it over to Deputy Premier. Thank you. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everyone. When we first announced COVID-19 testing targets, 4,000 tests were being conducted per day. On Thursday, April 30th, we reached well over 16,000 tests in a day, nearly a week ahead of our target for 16,000 tests per day by May 6th. We did so by forming a province-wide COVID-19 testing network that includes over 20 organizations. This has allowed us to eliminate the backlog of 11,000 tests and then turn our focus to testing priority groups and vulnerable populations, including every resident and staff member in a long-term care home. Indeed, expanding testing is critical to containing and limiting the spread of this new virus, both in our communities and in long-term care homes and other shared living spaces. We are now a leader in Canada in daily testing per capita and rank among the top globally. Still, we continue to invest in further expanding our COVID-19 testing. Our strategy is focused on maximizing testing capacity by working as an integrated lab testing network across the province. This is being achieved through daily check-ins and processes designed to address the need for supplies, test turnaround times, alternative approaches to processing, and emerging technology. The integration of our laboratory network will serve as an enduring legacy once this outbreak is over and a great example of how we can strengthen our healthcare system through integration to better serve and protect the people of Ontario. Thank you. We'll go to the phone line for questions. Just a reminder, one question, one follow-up. First question. First question comes from Martin Reg Cohen from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. 
Hello, my question Hello. is for the Premier. You've yes. talked a lot about the impact of the pandemic on our nursing homes and how you want to fix it. What's your personal view about the ownership of nursing homes? Given what's going well, on, is there a difference? Is there a difference between private ownership and public ownership in terms of the outcome? Well, I, I think there's a difference, but what I said right from day one, Martin, uh, the system's broke and, and we're, we are gonna fix it. But if you don't mind, Martin, I'm gonna pass it over to the uh, Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. So, you know, our ministry that was dedicated to long-term care uh, started in the summer. And one of the first things we looked at was uh, capacity issues in long-term care, staffing issues in long-term care. Many of these issues have been decades in the making, and this sector was neglected for decades. We look across the board, we see uh, different homes being affected in uh, many different ways, but obviously it's staffing um, that is a crisis right now. And uh, this is not specific to any particular um, type of home, but we know that uh, we need to move forward uh, with a plan coming from this. Uh, once we are done, focusing on the, the, the crises we have at hand. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, my follow-up is for the Premier. You've mentioned a lot of CEOs that you've talked to over the last few weeks of this pandemic. Have you also spoken to Mike Harris in his capacity as chair of Chartwell Homes? And if so, what did you learn from him? What did you say to him? And if you have not yet, will you reach out to him? And either way, whether you've spoken to him or not, what would be your message to him and to other operators, private or public, in this pandemic and going forward? What are, what are they telling you and what are you telling them, Mr. Harris in particular? Well, I, I had, I think, one call in the last six weeks uh, from former Premier Harris to ask how he was doing. And, and to be frank, I didn't even know he was the chair of uh, Chartwell, but uh, we're going to have that opportunity to sit down and uh, fix these issues right, right across the board. But he basically, the conversation lasted a couple minutes. How's your family doing? How's yours? And uh, that, that was about it. Next question. Next question comes from Haley Cooper from News Talk 1010. Please go ahead. Hi, my first question is for either you, Premier Ford, or uh, Health Minister Christine Elliott. We want to know if the province has considered or is it already in the works that certain hospitals in larger to medium-sized cities where there's multiple hospitals, yeah. could some of those hospitals be designated for COVID-19 patients and therefore the, the hospitals uh, that won't be treating COVID-19 patients could possibly be opened up uh, to begin safely doing elective surgeries? Well, you're pretty bang on there, but I'm going to pass this over to the Minister of Health. Thanks, Ellie. Yes, thank you for the question. It is something that we are taking a look at as we uh, develop our plan to open up um, elective procedures for cardiac cancer surgeries and other orthopedic surgeries. Uh, that is one of the suggestions that we have a COVID-free hospital so that um, they, uh, there's one that will deal with the COVID patients, one that will deal more with the elective surgeries. But it's dependent on that and a number of other factors as well how these hospitals will be able to open up because among other things they will need to have the staff some of the staff as you know staff members have gone to assist in uh, long-term care homes right now they also need to have a, uh, a, a their own supply of personal protective equipment so that they can conduct these surgeries in addition to the uh, the drugs and other medications they need in order to be able to conduct the surgeries so that is one of the elements, having a COVID-free hospital is an idea, but there's a lot of other issues that have to come forward. But we are finalizing a plan. We hope to have it uh, to present to all of you very shortly because we do know there are so many people that are very anxious about having their surgery, uh, particularly for serious issues like uh, cancer and cardiac issues. So we are dealing with that, and as I said, we hope to have information, uh, more detailed information for you very soon. Thank you. And my follow-up question is for the Premier. 
we've been focused so much on what businesses can reopen and when, but people really want to know when they can safely hug a loved one, like their parents or siblings. You know, when can they invite maybe a small group of friends over to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and other milestones? So are we any closer to getting an answer on that? Well, I think we're getting uh, closer right across the, the province. The, the numbers are, are coming down, Haley, and uh, the, I think the opportunity will, will come hopefully sooner than later. Uh, again, Haley, if, if I knew the exact date, uh, honestly, I'd be telling you in, in 10 seconds up here, but none of us really know the, the exact date. Let's continue working uh, hard uh, all together as a province, and we have been, and those numbers are, are showing the results uh, of that. And, the sooner we can have some loved ones over, and you're right, give them a hug, um, then then we're going to get uh, we're going to get that uh, moving as quickly as possible. So let's just keep working on on reducing the numbers, and the quicker we do that, the quicker we'll be able to uh, have some loved ones over for maybe a barbecue or so. Next question. Next question comes from Albert Delatala from Global News. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my uh, question is for the Premier. Um, what happens um, to parents' money um, if a day school such as one that we're investigating the GTA declares bankruptcy under the emergency order? Well, that, that's a very good question. And, Albert, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ask our uh, minister uh, that. But we, we did make sure that we uh, had the parents stop paying. They wouldn't lose their spot. That was a big issue. At, at one point, they were they were paying daycare, and the, the kids weren't going to daycare. So we were able to secure that, and uh, also secure their their spot in uh, daycare. But it's a good uh, good question. Hopefully, hopefully we won't have too many uh, daycare uh, facilities going under. But I will get back to you on that, Albert. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Next question comes from Randy Rath from CHBH TV. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Premier. Hi, Randy. Um, we've been hearing from um, greenhouse and nursery operators, and they're complaining that they aren't playing on a level playing field with um, garden centers that are. Sorry, Randy, you're very muscled. To a Can grocery you? Grocery store or, a, or a, a, a similar store like that. That in those in those stores that in those group um, garden centers, they can go in and pick out their own plants, but it's only curbside and delivery yeah. at uh, garden centers that are standalone. Yeah. Um, can, can that be opened up anymore with social distancing? Yeah. You know something, uh, Randy, uh, again, you're, I think you're, you're bang on. I, think, I thought it was unfair, too. The reason some of the big box stores were able to open up, they had pharmacies and food in it, but uh, they had other items in there, and do I agree it's unfair? Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, the aisles were a little wider in the big stores. But in saying that, stay tuned, Randy. Uh, we're going to have some good news for these folks uh, this week. So we're, we're going to get uh, moving on that. Okay, my next question is, um, on the weekend, uh, we did a story down in Haldeman, Norfolk, yeah. about people not being allowed to go to their cottages along the shore of Lake Erie. Uh, the medical officer of health in that area has said, you know, no, no people from outside of the um, uh, community can go to their cottages. And, and, and the people that go to those cottages just go, they, they just want to go, take their own food, not interact with anybody, no. and, and, and just, um, and then leave. And the chief medical officer of health, when I asked him last week, said that he doesn't really see a problem in that. And I'm just wondering, if, if, those, if those people can't go to their cottages, should they be able to get their taxes back that they've paid to, on those cottages this year? Well, you're nailing all the, the questions, uh, Randy, today, because I agree with you. Um, I had a conversation with one of the mayors in Muskoka. I've asked to get on a conference call with all the, the mayors in uh, cottage uh, country. And uh, we, we did the right thing, and we're continuing to do the right thing, make sure that we... Uh, social distance and self-isolate when we can. But as we see the numbers uh, come down, and uh, by May the 24th, uh, hopefully the numbers uh, are going to continue coming down. We're going to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation this week with the mayors. Uh, there's only so long uh, you can you hold back uh, taxpayers from going to their their uh, 
their cottages. Uh, I'll give you an example of Muskoka. Muskoka, the vast majority of taxes are paid through cottages, cottagers, and uh, you know, and, and the economy up there. When I was speaking to the mayor, uh, people rely. Uh, the retail stores in the cottage country rely on cottagers from beginning of May, probably April, all the way through to September. That's their livelihood. So if people are responsible, the numbers continue to go down. Uh, we'll have that uh, conversation. So if you follow up by the end of the week, I, I, I think it's Wednesday or Thursday, we're having a, a uh, conference, phone conference, and I'll get their input. And I understand uh, what they're saying, but uh, if, if people go up to their cottage, bring their own food, don't go to the stores, stay at their cottage uh, by May the 24th, there's only so long I can hold the big gates back from, from these people. Uh, they're going to want to go to their vacation property. I understand. And I think we've made the right decision uh, about the cottagers. Uh, but as we see the numbers uh, go down, uh, let, let's just see what, what happens. But I'm going to have that uh, a wholesome conversation with all the, the mayors in the next couple of days. And we'll see where we go from there. Next question. Next question comes from Laura Stone from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Hi there. My Hi. question is for Minister Fullerton. Yeah. Um, Minister, it's my understanding that there are still about a dozen high-priority long-term care homes that have not yet received extra help from hospitals, extra staff, as well as more than 100 homes in the so-called yellow zone that also need help. So why has it taken so long and when are these high priority homes going to get the help they need? Well, we're tracking this very carefully and monitoring the homes. We're in regular contact with the homes uh, to assess their staffing situation and the PPEs. And as I mentioned before, the staffing uh, crisis was pre-existing before uh, the pandemic hit. And so we clearly understand the, the dire situation that our most needy homes are in. And we're making sure resources are getting to those homes while we monitor the others. So whether this comes through ho um, uh, hospitals or home care or the military assistance, which we're all very grateful for. Um, but we're making sure we get PPE to our homes within 24 hours if they need it. We're making sure that we have staffing that's adequate and, and that making sure the standards of care uh, are held. Uh, looking at everything possible on the table to support all of our homes as we get through this crisis. But why are there still uh, 10 homes that are in a high priority zone that have not received anything? And also, uh, why aren't you revealing which names in the province need the most help? Why can't you tell the public and the family members that their home is among them? Well, what we have is uh, we've been very transparent. We have a list that's, that's publicly available so that people can see the status of the homes. And we're making sure that the homes uh, that are um, identified as urgent need are getting the, the, the help that they need. This is an ongoing effort. We're working across uh, the board to make sure our homes get the support they, they need. And 24 hours a day, uh, we have a command table that has uh, priority um, aspects to it, so making sure that those regional tables get the support to our homes that need it. There's a, a complete structure um, that is coordinated to getting that help out to our homes. And we've been very transparent um, about the numbers. We've been very transparent uh, about the homes. We've been transparent about the homes needing military assistance. And uh, I believe that that is the approach that's necessary, uh, transparency, and uh, we'll do everything possible to make sure those homes get the support that they need. Next question. Next question comes from Colin DeMello from CTV News. Please go ahead. Hi there, good afternoon. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, in other provinces, um, some businesses feel a bit hesitant to open because right now they don't have the proper PPE available. Um, last week you had mentioned that the province would try to help businesses that need help uh, finding uh, the proper protective equipment for their employees. Do you have any more clarity on exactly how the province will help businesses find PPE? I was just on the, on the phone with a couple of large uh, retailers this morning working with the Retail Association uh, and other associations within the retail sector. And, uh, you know, they, they, in some cases, uh, they have better contacts than the government over overseas uh, on, on buying goods. Or some of them are the largest buyers of, of goods uh, to put into their, their stores. And uh, I mentioned to them that we need to bring in as many PPE uh, items as, as possible. 
they're telling me uh, they're they're okay. They they can get it in. So I'm I'm relying on the the retail association and other uh, large retailers. If you have extra, uh, share it share it with some of the smaller uh, retailers as as well. Plus we're ramping up on the domestic side on the PBE, especially the N95s with uh, Woodbridge, and we're we're going full out. I, on the weekend I went over to a, a gown and a mask manufacturer here in Toronto uh, to see how they're coming along. Uh, but it's all, all hands on deck. And as, as we're, as every day goes by, uh, more and more calls are coming in saying that uh, people want to invest and open up a uh, PPE manufacturing uh, facility. So and we, we also have that fund of $50 million to support people that want to open up. So we're, we're doing everything we can to make sure we get uh, domestic supply as soon as possible. There isn't a day calling that goes by. I don't talk to four, five, six people. I'm being conservative that uh, want to open up. And the and the big uh, the big players uh, that don't have a facility here uh, spoke to one of the big big companies uh, this morning, and I said, "You got to start manufacturing here in in uh, Ontario or Canada somewhere. You can't be shipping it in from the U.S. You know, th these days are going to be over. We're going to start relying on our, our on our, ourselves rather than relying on these foreign countries, foreign governments that when, uh, you know, all heck breaks loose, they, they close the borders and say you aren't getting any more goods. Uh, we're, we're all over this and we've ramped up with a couple of disinfectant uh, wipe companies as well that are, are uh, ramping up uh, as well. So we're, we're getting there, but uh, we'll, we're moving as quickly as we can. Next question. Okay, and uh, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for oh, thank you. Um, and, and Premier, just on uh, education, um, you know, today was supposed to be the day that students were heading back to class. Obviously, that's being pushed back until uh, next month um, at the at the earliest, if possible. I'm just curious about distance learning for students. Um, you have young children in your extended family. Yeah. What have you been hearing about how well? distance learning is working right now because some teachers say it's quite difficult to actually educate students um, virtually. Yeah, I think uh, the, the older kids, kids in high school and probably middle school, they, they understand it. The, the younger kids, it's uh, the five and six year olds telling them they can't play with little Susie or Johnny. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, really sink in. Uh, so that's something we really have to focus on. And and uh, especially if that the decision is made and the decision has not been made, uh, if the kids are going to go back in, in June sometime. But a uh, very good point, Colin. We, we really have to monitor it. But I, I think the high school kids, they, they get it. Matter of fact, I know they get it. And uh, I think the other kids, uh, the grades 6, 7, and 8, they get it as well. Next question. Next question comes from Cynthia Milliken from City TV. Please go ahead. Hi, Premier. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, today you dipped your toe into opening up the, co the economy ever so slightly, but I'm curious why random community testing has not started when experts say that it needs to begin before the economy opens so that a proper baseline is created. Why, haven't, why hasn't the government started that? Well, I had that conversation with the, uh, some of the folks on the health table today, and uh, it is being started. Uh, our main crisis was obviously long-term care, retirement homes, congregate living uh, locations. So we want to put all our resources there first. But uh, moving forward, we're going to be doing that. Uh, also, I know you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to I'm going to mention it anyways. Had a conversation with the deputy uh, prime minister today. I'm going to follow up with the the premiers. We have another uh, premiers meeting. I believe it's on Thursday. Uh, we we need a national plan for contact tracing. And uh, it's, it's, you know, right now each individual province is doing it, but we need a national plan, work with the federal government and uh, all, all, uh, all the provinces, the, the 10 provinces and the three territories. It's absolutely critical uh, moving forward uh, for many reasons, especially not to mention uh, research as well. Thank you. And for follow-up, uh, some provinces are doing, are creating family bubbles where, um, they can merge together and, you know, go see a grandparent, for example. Would that be a next step in Ontario? If the numbers continue uh, going down, um, let, let's just see. I just, I just don't want to answer right, right now this early. Maybe if you ask me this next week, we'll, we'll see some uh, even better results than what we've already, what we've already seen. Next question. 
Next question comes from Lisa Shing from CBC. Please go ahead. Hi there, Premier. I spoke with some PSWs in long-term care homes who contracted COVID-19 after uh, taking care of infected residents with just a surgical mask. Uh, they say they want the option of an N95 mask, and there is some evidence out there that points to the possibility COVID-19 can be spread via airborne particles. So uh, why not take all possible precautions and, and give healthcare workers the option of an N95 mask as the research is coming in? Well, I, I agree, but let me pass this over to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you. So first of all, I, I want to acknowledge all of our frontline, the, the personal support workers who are so dedicated and compassionate every single day and how much uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, looking at the PSW and the P P uh, PPEs, understanding the Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, gives directives in terms of the required PPE. Um, surgical masks are what is required uh, for COVID-19 according to the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Of course, evidence is uh, always evolving and uh, the scientific literature um, is being vetted by, by our public health officials, Public Health Ontario and, and doc, doc, Dr. David Williams. And so this is something that, uh, that will be, have to uh, um, be ongoing in terms of understanding the spread of COVID-19. Thank you. And my next question uh, is for the Premier. Uh, we've spoken to some business owners who say they were caught off guard by uh, Friday's announcement about opening up and they would have appreciated more time to get the PPE and implement uh, the appropriate safety protocols. Uh, we've also heard from garden centres that say it's too late uh, for a lot of their flowers and plants that are going to waste. Uh, so my question they're kind of double barreled. Uh, when did the province inform these businesses of the plans to reopen? And couldn't places like garden centers have been uh, open this entire time with physical distancing measures in place like grocery stores? Well, with, with anything, we, we talked to the, the Ministry of Health, we talked to the health table, talked to the Minister of Labour, we talked to the stakeholders, the, the business sector that they're involved in and uh, we get their input. Now, there's never, never a decision that one person makes. I, I don't make a decision by myself. I always, always consult with people. We, we try to give them a few days, but uh, all those businesses were all seasonal businesses, outdoor, uh, you know, gardening uh, and landscaping or, or other areas, even uh, the, the marinas too. So there, there haven't uh, been a, you know, a, a huge issue that I've, I've heard on the on the retail side because we really haven't opened up the the small retail uh, stores yet but when when we uh, make that announcement uh, I, I'll, I'll give it the message right now uh, retail start start prepping no matter if it's three weeks four weeks two weeks whenever it is uh, start prepping getting uh, getting masks uh, ready so there's the uh, there's the warning right now it's it's coming it's inevitable the numbers keep going down uh, we're gonna get the economy going based on health and science. I got to keep emphasizing that. Just because we open up these stores, it doesn't mean it's a, it's a free-for-all. We still have to follow the protocol of the Chief Medical Officer and uh, we're going to continue making sure that we take those measures. Last question. Last question comes from Rajinder Saini from Parvasi Media Group. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Premier. This Good is Rajinder Saini from Parvasi. Uh, Premier, ethnic media outlets in Ontario and all over country are playing very vital role to uh, to inform their communities, uh, hundreds and thousands of people whose first language is neither uh, English nor French. But these business, uh, businesses are struggling at the moment, Premier. Uh, they are not able to print their newspapers. Uh, they are not able to broadcast the radio shows because they don't have any ad revenue, which is the only source of their income. So having a small size operations, uh, most of their staff uh, is not on payroll, like paper distribution or sales. So they are not eligible for $40,000 loan from the federal government and not for 75% wages uh, benefit. So they are really struggling. Yep. Any help they can expect from the government? Well, very, very good point. And uh, right as soon as we put out the advertising budget, my first uh, comment out of my mouth, was we're making sure that the ethnic media gets a piece of the pie uh, to keep them going. I want to thank 
not just the ethnic media, but media in general. Uh, you've been absolutely incredible getting the message out. We've all worked together, and I just want to thank uh, the media for doing that. But uh, may maybe what we can do is follow up on a call because uh, right, right from the get-go, uh, everyone should get an equal uh, piece of the pie, per se. And uh, I emphasize to make sure the ethnic media uh, ended up getting some funding for advertising about COVID. I will follow up on that. Uh, Premier, my follow-up question is regarding emergency rental assistance announced by the Prime Minister. I have three questions. The first question is that PMI, which is very substantial part of the gross rent, is that included in this rent, in this assistance? And number two, most of the landlords are not willing to take that forgivable loan and put their 25% share. So that is why most of the you know, uh, businesses they have got already noticed what, what I understand, I'll confirm this with the, the finance minister, it's uh, all inclusive. It wasn't before, now, now it is. So just to break it down, the, the landlord would pick up 25%, the uh, tenant would take 25%, and the federal and provincial governments would pay the, the 50%. And it's over a $900 million uh, plan, and uh, hopefully they can work through this. But if we continue, if we continue seeing the downward slope, hopefully we won't be in this... Uh, position over the next uh, few weeks as long as we get approval from the chief medical officer our health uh, uh, team and our, our minister of labor i just want to keep emphasizing that because i just don't want people thinking we're, we're going to open up and you know uh, we're, we're all free to do what we want it's just not going to be that way for a while but hopefully we'll be able to get these stores opened up sooner than later thank you thank you everyone thank you